Abba, we come into your presence and thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. You saw that we were helpless in sin and you conquered the wages of our sin, death, by your death and resurrection. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Come, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Bible study written by Dr. David Jeremiah. It is the seventh lesson of Romans 8, the greatest chapter in the Bible, Five Unshakable Promises. This lesson is based on Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 36. Here we learn the incredible benefits we receive from the work of Christ in our lives. When Christ died on the cross and rose three days later, he paid the penalty of sin for all who believe. If that is all he ever did for us, eternity would not be long enough to thank him for the sacrifice on our behalf from the cross. But Christ continues to bless us each day with a multitude of blessings and with promises to help us live a victorious life here on earth. Bill Moyers made a film about the hymn Amazing Grace. This documentary includes a concert scene that was filmed at Wembley Stadium in London. Various musical groups, mostly rock bands, had gathered together in a concert celebration of the political changes made in South Africa. Amidst all the rock music, the promoters surprisingly scheduled opera singer Jesse Norman as the closing act. The film cuts back and forth between scenes of the unruly crowd in the stadium and Jesse Norman being interviewed by Bill Moyers. For 12 hours, groups like Guns N' Roses are blasting the inebriated crowd through banks of speakers. Meanwhile, Jesse Norman sits in a dressing room discussing Amazing Grace with Bill Moyers, telling him that John Newton's famous melody may have been borrowed from a tune sung by slaves themselves. Finally, the time comes for her to sing. A single circle of light follows Norman, a majestic African-American woman wearing a flowing African dashiki as she strolled on stage. There is no backup band and there are no musical instruments, only Jesse Norman. The crowd stirs, restless. The scene is getting ugly, alone, a cappella that is without instrumental accompaniment and very purposefully, Jesse Norman begins to sing the song about the amazing grace of God and a remarkable thing happens. There in Wembley Stadium that night, several thousand raucous fans fell silent before the Aria of Grace. For those of us who are not familiar with vocabulary related to music, aria is a long accompanied song for a solo voice, typically one in an opera. Some things are so wonderful that the only proper response to them is a response of silence. After presenting the wonderful truths of our relationship with God through the five links of salvation, Paul asks for a response. But he knows there can be one. In Romans chapter 8 verse 31, he asks this question. What then shall we say to these things? What shall we say about how God foreknew us, chose us, called us, justified us and glorified us? In our heart, we know there isn't anything we can say. So Paul adds to his question. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 31. It seems quite obvious that the things Paul is talking about here are not only the things he has just discussed in chapter 8. He's talking about all the wonderful things that have been discussed in the entire book of Romans. Therefore, his question might be better translated this way. What is there left to say after you have said it all? Paul goes on to ask five questions of his readers. And we will do the same today in this lesson. 
Just listen to Romans chapter 8 verses 32 to 36 as I read it for you. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The great British preacher John Stott sees Paul's interrogation like this. The apostle's answer to his own question is to ask five more questions, to which there is no answer. He hurls them into space. In a spirit of bold defiance, he challenges anybody and everybody to answer them and to deny the truth which they contain. But there is no answer. For no one and nothing can harm the people whom God has foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. In answering these five questions, we will discover five unshakable promises that can give us courage and hope in the midst of our fallen world. I don't know about you, but I need these promises. I need them right here and right now. Just as there are five links in the chain of salvation that we had discussed last week, There are five convictions that flow out of these wonderful verses. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no intimidation. The first question Paul asks in verse 31 is, If God is for us, who can be against us? The way Paul poses this question, he's assuming a positive response. We could easily translate it this way, Because God is for us, Who can be against us? Now, if Paul had asked who could be against us, there would be numerous answers to that question. We all have people against us. But that is not the issue here. Paul did not ask who can be against us. The question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? What a big difference that little word if makes. In other words, if anyone were able to take away our salvation, they would have to be greater than God himself. Romans 8 verse 1 tells us, quote, that for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation, unquote. Who could possibly reverse that statement? If such a person were to exist, he would have to be greater than God himself. All the powers of hell may set themselves together against us, but they can never prevail since God is on our side. Because God is for us, it makes not the slightest particle of difference who is against us. No folk can ever prevail against people who are supported by a God like that. The Christian's confidence is in God, not in anything he or she can do for themselves. For all eternity, the Christian can rely on God. Paul is not speaking out of grim desperation, but in joyous elation. The problem isn't the greatness of our problems. The problem is the smallness of God. If we allow God to be pushed into the corner so that he does not exist except in our conversations, then our problems overwhelm us. So the question you have to ask yourself is, how big is my God? And the best way to see God in all his greatness and beauty and majesty is through the word. Because of the greatness of our God, we cannot be intimidated by the enemy. There is nothing anyone can do to change the nature of our God. He's almighty God. And if God is for you, nobody can be against you. Nobody. They can try. But what a useless effort it would be for them. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no intimidation. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no deprivation. Paul then asks in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, 
but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Unquote. This is an argument from the greatest to the least. If God did the very best thing that could ever be done for you, don't you think you can trust him to do the other things that you need him to do? If God gave us his son, what do you think he will withhold from us? He has already given us the best he has to give. It is easy for us to take for granted the truth that this verse contains. But think for a moment. Think about this thought. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. God, the judge, has an only son who is very precious to him, and that son never committed any sin. In all he did, he was ever pleasing to his father. John chapter 8, verse 29. Yet, on this precious and beloved son, God now pronounced a sentence we deserved. He, the son, fully bore that horrendous curse. He drank the cup of unspeakable agony to the very last drop. And now it's empty for you and me. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no accusation. Paul then continues, quote, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Verse 33. This third question is very important because a lot of people live under the tyranny of misunderstanding of this verse. In the last book of the Bible, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Revelations chapter 12 verse 10. Even though the world and Satan are always bringing charges against God's people, those charges cannot stick because the one who justifies is also the one who is the judge. Marcus Rainsford commentary eliminates every possibility of condemnation with these words. There is no ground for condemnation since Christ has suffered the penalty. There is no law to condemn us since we are not under law but under grace. There is no tribunal for judgment since ours is a throne of grace, not a judgment and above all there is no judge to sentence us since God himself, the only judge, is our justifier. Who then can accuse you? Satan can try to accuse you, but he's going to fail miserably and face the advocate you and I have in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Paul reminds the reader that for those who have been freed by the death and resurrection of Christ, no accusation will ever stand against us. Perhaps you have been intimidated by something you did in the past. One thing I've learned, Satan has a good memory and at certain times he will remind you of your past failures in an attempt to discourage you and cause you to feel unworthy as a Christian. When that happens, go to the scripture and say, it is God who justifies. The one who forgave you is the only one who could ever hold you accountable for your past. And he's already made provision for you through his grace and forgiveness. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Question number four is found in verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. This is a great and tremendous verse. Is there anyone who can condemn us? The answer is no. And as believers, we have a fourfold protection in Jesus Christ. We are protected by Christ's crucifixion. The scripture says Christ died on the cross and took on the condemnation we deserved. We cannot be condemned because he has already been condemned for us. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 tells us that, quote, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, unquote. Christ's crucifixion protects us from the curse and from condemnation. We are protected by Christ's resurrection. The next part of verse 34 reads, And furthermore is also risen. How does the resurrection of Jesus Christ protect us? When Jesus came back from the grave, he proved his 
victory over sin and over death. And it is not just the fact that he rose from the dead, but, they, but that he was raised from the dead by the Father. This demonstrates that the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of the Son as the only basis for our justification. The fact that the Father brought Jesus out of the grave was the receipt that was filled for the payment that was made on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And when he came out of the grave, the Father in heaven said, paid in full, paid in full. His resurrection is the actual proof of our justification. We are protected by Christ's exaltation. We are protected by Christ Jesus' exaltation, who is even at the right hand of God. The Bible says that Christ is now at the right hand of God in heaven. The exaltation of Jesus Christ to the right hand of God, the Father symbolizes the honor and power and authority given him as a reward for his accomplished work. Jesus now sits at the right hand of God the Father, living out his eternal reward for accomplishing our total forgiveness. Why is Jesus seated in heaven? Because he doesn't have anything more he needs to do for you. What he did was sufficient for anything that will ever happen in your life. His exaltation is another proof of your protection. Here is an interesting fact in the Old Testament temple. There were never any chairs for the priests. Why? Because the work of the priests in dealing with sin was never done. There was never time to sit down. But in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 tells us that Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus didn't sit down because he was tired. He sat down because he was finished. And like the priest who continually made sacrifices for the same sins, Jesus accomplished all in one act. There will never be another sacrifice required for sin. The work is done. We are protected by Christ's intercession. Verse 34 concludes that Christ makes intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 puts it this way. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Sometimes you may think, I don't have the right to come before a holy God. None of us do. We come before God only through the intercession of Jesus Christ, who is also God. He's our intercessor. When anybody comes with an accusation against us, we have someone in heaven who is representing us, none other than Jesus, the Son of the living God. So when you think back on the question of who will condemn, the answer is no one. Christ took care of it all through his death, burial, resurrection, exaltation and intercession. He stands ever representing us in the presence of God saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Chapter 8 verse 1. For the believer in Jesus Christ, there is no separation. Notice what Paul says in verse 35, quote, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? When Paul is speaking here of the love of Christ, he's not talking about our love for Christ. He's talking about Christ's love for us. Just recall 1 John, 1 John chapter 4 verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. Paul is not saying who can cause us to stop loving God. He's saying who can cause Christ to stop loving us. And the answer to that question is not to be found in the seven things that he lists in this verse. Neither tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril or the sword can separate you from the love of Christ. And these are just representative forces. This is not an exhaustive list. In fact, all of these things are found in Paul's own life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12, 
we read about Paul's life and all the things he experienced. A detailed study reveals that he experienced all seven of those things. He just listed except for one, the sword. And ultimately he was killed by the sword. So who or what is going to separate us from the love of Christ? If it's up to us, there could be many things. But praise God, it's not up to us. It's not even really about our love for Christ. It's all about Christ's love for us. And Paul says there's nothing that can ever keep him from loving us. Harold Voichel was a missionary in Korea at a time of the Korean War. He was drafted into the army and assigned to prisoner of war camps as a chaplain. Tens of thousands of North Koreans were imprisoned in those camps. Some were communists who were active in stirring up riots and rebellion. When Volkel entered the first camp, he immediately won the men's interest because he could speak their language. And he said he wanted to do only one thing, and that was to teach them a song. It was the Korean version of a children's hymn. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. When Chaplain Vogel had finished teaching the song in one camp, he went to the next camp and did the same thing. In fact, he covered all of the prisoners of war camps in Korea, teaching them one simple fact, Jesus loves me. Then he went around the camps again, but the next time he taught them a few simple things about this person, Jesus. He did this for months, and as a result of his effort, thousands of prisoners became believers. When the truce finally came and the country was divided at the infamous 38th parallel, thousands of these former prisoners of war refused to return to North Korea and communism. Instead, they chose to live in South Korea, where they could continue to learn about and worship the Jesus who loved them. Is there anything better than to know that you are loved by God and loved by Jesus? Because of his love, nothing can ever affect your standing with God. Yes, Jesus loves you. Please remember that simple truth. Don't forget that he loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter how many times you allow the accuser to intimidate you, you have no condemnation because you have been forgiven. Jesus loves you. Grace and peace to all under the influence of my voice. I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health as you prosper in his word. Amen.